Hi, this is Simon Fowler from the University of Glasgow. Today, I'll be talking about how we've tightened the correspondence between session types and linear logic using ideas from hypersequent calculi. This is joint work with my colleagues Wen Cocker, Ornella Dada, Sam Lindley, and Garrett Morris. The simply typed lambda calculus is built on firm logical foundations. So the Curry-Howard correspondence tells us that propositions in logic can be thought of as types, proofs can be thought of as programs, and proof normalization can be thought of as evaluation. The correspondence with logic means that the simply typed lambda calculus is very well behaved, enjoying properties such as strong normalization. In the 90s, a line of work started by Abramsky considered whether there's a similar correspondence for concurrent computation. A landmark paper by Kairos and Fenning in 2010 demonstrated a logical basis for a process calculus with session types, which type communication protocols. Here, propositions can be thought of as session types, proofs can be thought of as processes, and cut elimination can be thought of as communication. Now, Kairos and Fenning work in the setting of intuitionistic linear logic. In 2012, Phil Wadler introduced CP, a session type process calculus built around classical linear logic, and also GV, a session type functional programming language inspired by the work of Gay and Vas Vasconcelos. Unlike CP, GV has a distinction between the program that the user writes and the state that arises during execution. Now, so far I've mentioned session types in passing, but let's see some concrete ones. So session types can be thought of as types for protocols. Now, suppose we have a vending machine, which can only be used by one person at a time. The vending machine begins by communicating whether it's free or busy. If it's free, then it offers the choice between two buttons, one, which dispenses or sends a candy bar, and two, which dispenses a cookie. If it's busy, then the session ends. We can also write a session type for the customer. Now you'll notice here that where the vending machine sends, the customer receives, and where the vending machine makes a choice, then the customer offers a selection. So this duality means that the communication between the two parties is safe and that no deadlocks arise within a single session. Now let's have a look at a GV program. So the vending machine function takes a channel endpoint of type vending machine, selects the free branch, and then offers the two branches one and two. Each S endpoint must be used precisely once in order to guarantee safety. Now the customer offers two behaviors based on whether the vending machine is free or busy. So if it's busy, then the customer closes the connection and goes away hungry. Otherwise it selects button two, receives a cookie, closes the connection and then eats the cookie. So let's have a look at how we can run this program. So the fork construct spawns a thread which runs the vending machine function and returns a channel endpoint used to communicate with the vending machine. Now this big yellow blob means that this is the main thread of the program. Now after evaluating the fork, our runtime state looks a bit like this. We have a name restriction which says that we have a channel with endpoints X and Y. The main thread gets endpoint Y and acts as the customer, and the child thread gets endpoint X and acts as the vending machine. At this point, select and offer construct synchronize, which selects the free branch in the customer. Next, the customer selects button two, which in turn causes the vending machine to vend a cookie, which is then received by the customer. Now, the channel is closed by the wait keyword, which garbage collects the name restriction and the child thread, and the cookie monster can finally eat his cookie. So Wadler's original paper showed a type-preserving translation from GV into CP. Later, Nundley and Morris showed a translation in the other direction, and by introducing the semantics for a tweet version of GV, showed that the translations were also semantics-preserving. So in the rest of the talk, we'll concentrate on uh, Lindley and Morris's version of GV. So GV relies on two typing judgments. The first ensures that terms are well typed, and this is what you'd write a type checker for. And the second is an extrinsic type system for runtime processes, and this is layered on to help us state invariants which let us prove properties about GV. So because of its correspondence with linear logic, GV is very well behaved. 
So as you'd expect, it satisfies the preservation property, which by extension ensures that every communication action is supported by a session type. In addition, GV also enjoys global progress, which means that there are no deadlocks and that the system doesn't get stuck. And finally, GV is deterministic and also strongly normalizing. Okay, so this paints a really nice picture. Two logically grounded calculi with strong correctness properties and tight correspondences. In that case, why am I talking to you today? To see why, let's have a bit more of a look at CP. So here is the CP interpretation of the classical linear logic cut rule. The process can be read as bind endpoint X in process P, endpoint Y in process Q, and run P and Q in parallel. So in order to get deadlock freedom, this glues together two pi calculus constructs, so name restriction and parallel composition. The CEP interpretation of the classical linear logic tensor rule is also a good example of this. So we can read this process as send endpoint y along x, binding y in p and x in q, and then run p and q in parallel. So ideally, we'd want to separate output and parallel composition constructs. Okay, so what? So we didn't see anything like this in the GV example. From a programming language perspective, why should CP's lack of modularity matter? So a large part of the problem lies in how GV proves deadlock freedom. So in particular, how we can reason about the tree structure that the fork construct gives us. So GV relies on an extrinsic type system for processes, which encodes the invariant that precisely one pair of endpoints is split over each parallel composition. The idea is that name restrictions introduce this S-sharp pseudotype inspired by the linear pi calculus which is then eliminated by parallel composition. As a result, we get acyclicity and therefore deadlock freedom by construction. Although this is sufficient to show deadlock freedom, it's also very inflexible. So say we have two channels with endpoints X and X prime and Y and Y prime, and say configuration C contains X, D contains Y, and E contains both X prime and Y prime. We can begin by putting D and E in parallel, since we know the processes communicate over Y and Y prime. Then we can put C in parallel with that, since we know the process is communicator over X and X prime. We can then bind the endpoints using name restrictions and we have a well-typed closed process. If we try and reassociate to the left, however, we run into problems. The issue is that C and D don't communicate, so we can't put them in parallel. Similarly, there's no way to join E to the rest of the configuration. Now this makes the meta theory really unpleasant to work with. So in particular, we need a more complex preservation theorem and every language extending GV must then either inherit this burden or give up on proving deadlock freedom altogether. There's also a really annoying problem with the correspondence between CP and GV, which stems from the fact that CP doesn't support a label transition semantics and therefore doesn't have a behavioral theory. So as an example, we can't write a transition rule for output since the right-hand side is not a CP process. To get a semantics preservation result, GV therefore needs to rely on weak explicit substitutions in order to show that beta reduction is preserved by the translation. Now this changes the reduction of strategy of GV and clutters the language just to exhibit a correspondence. So hypersequence, originally introduced by Avron in the 90s, are collections of logical sequence. They've already been used in type concurrency, for example, by Carbonium uh, Montesi and Schurman, who use them to give a logical grounding to choreographies. So in 2019, um, Cocker, Montesi and Perisotti had the idea of using these collections of typing environments called hyper environments to register parallelism in CP typing judgments instead of in terms. So using hyper environments allowed them to pull apart the constructs in CP while maintaining deadlock freedom. So for example, by using hyper environments, we can split the CP cut rule into separate constructs for name restriction and parallel composition. So here, red bottom up, the name restriction rule introduces a hyper environment separator between environments gamma one and gamma two, extending gamma one with endpoint X and gamma two with endpoint Y. <laughs> 
the rule for parallel composition then just makes trivial use of the parallelism that's already registered in the hyperenvironment. So the question we're asking in this work is whether we can use the same trick to solve some of the issues with GV. And because um, hypersequence CP has behavioral theory, whether we can now go and strengthen the logical correspondence. Well, the answer is yes. So our first contribution is hypersequent GV or HGV and its meta theory. In HGV, we follow exactly the same pattern as in HCP. So name restriction partitions a typing environment into two, adding an endpoint into each. The hyper environment separators are then used by the parallel composition rule. It turns out that just by doing this little tweak, we get a far better behaved calculus. Um, and this is only done on the level of configurations. So term typing for GV and HGV is exactly the same. So for example, HGV can type the troublesome GV example we had earlier. So unlike before, C and D don't need to communicate. We just need to keep track of the fact that X and Y must be used in separate threads, which we do by inserting a hyper environment separator. We can do the same for E. Then we merge the two rightmost hyper environments and remove Y and Y prime in order to hide the channel behind a name restriction. And finally, we can do the same for X and X prime. And from here, we can show a very standard preservation theorem without needing to resort to a special treatment of structural congruence. So we can show that structural congruence is type preserving. We can embed structural congruence in the reduction relation, and then we can show a perfectly normal um, preservation theorem. However, proving progress requires a bit of thought. So although GV's requirement that each parallel composition splits a single channel is restrictive, it's also quite a powerful reasoning tool, uh, and we can't use that in HGV. So instead, we introduce abstract process structures, which are graphs defined over hyperenvironments. The idea is that typing environments are nodes, and pairs of endpoints are edges. So as an example, consider the hyperenvironment G on the right, which consists of three typing environments. Gamma 1 uh, contains x and y, gamma 2 contains x prime and z, and gamma 3 contains y prime. So if we know that x and x prime, as well as y and y prime are conames, then we can construct the graph in the top right. Um, so you'll also notice that the graph in the top right is a tree. So the typing and rules ensure that every hyper environment arising in the derivation of an HGV program is tree structured. Using the notion of a tree abstract process structure, we can then write every tree structured HGV program in tree canonical form, where each auxiliary thread, um, so for example, child thread, is placed next to a name restriction that binds a name that occurs free in that thread. Um, and the proof is quite pretty. It follows from picking a leaf in the abstract process structure and noting that each typing environment corresponds to a thread. We can also write every open HGV configuration as a collection of independent configurations in tree canonical form. So if we restrict typing environments to only containing session types, we can show that configuration in tree canonical form can either reduce or each thread is blocked either on a preceding new bound variable or a variable in the typing environment. If we consider closed configurations where the main thread has a type which does not contain function or session types, then we know that either the configuration has reduced all the way to a value or it can reduce further. Um, we also get determinism and termination, uh, but the proofs for these are entirely unchanged. OK, so the next contribution uh, is relating HGV and GV. So. Every, every GV configuration is typable in HGV. To show this, we introduce splittings, which are HGV environments, uh, which maintain the separation enforced by the S-sharp pseudotype in GV. So as an example, consider gamma here, um, which contains an unsplit channel with endpoints X and Y, with session type, send a unit type and finish, and says that variable ping has the unit type. Now, hyper environment G is a splitting since it contains X and Y with dual session types and it forms a tree structured uh, abstract process structure. Then we can show that 
every GV configuration is typable in HGV under a splitting of its typing environment. And this falls out as a very straightforward induction. The same doesn't hold in the other direction. So as we've already seen, HGV types more processes than GV. However, HGV configurations in tree canonical form are typable in GV. And by extension, that means that every HGV configuration typable under a single typing environment is equivalent to a configuration that's typable in GV. Now, a third contribution is HGV's relationship with linear logic. In this case, uh, Cocker, Montesi and Perisotti's HCP calculus. We factor our translation through an intermediate subcalculus, HGV star, which has an explicit stratification between values and computations. Now, this allows us to separate out administrative reductions. We have three translations, one for values, one for terms, and one for configurations. I don't have time to go into the details of the translations here, but the idea is that the translations are parameterized by a result channel R. So whenever a value is available, we send a unit ping along R, followed by the value. Now, we can see this in the translation of HGV typing judgments to HCP here, where the R channel has a type which sends a ping and then continues as a channel capable of transmitting the return value. To get correspondence results, we make essential use of HCP's behavioral theory, which is very similar to the usual label transition system for a pi calculus with internal mobility. However, we distinguish three different types of internal action. So alpha actions characterize renaming, so for example, channel forwarding. Beta actions are communications, and then tau actions are either alpha or beta actions. So from here, we can instantiate bisimilarity, saturated transitions, and weak bisimilarity in the usual way. Now, instead of relying on weak explicit substitutions, HCP's behavioral theory allows us to get a much nicer treatment of substitution without needing to clutter HGV. So if we have a name uh, if we have a name restriction with endpoints w and w prime, where w is free and n, and where the translation of a value v sends the result along w prime, then we know that this is weakly bisimilar uh, to the translation of m with v substituted for w. Now, using this, we can show a tight operational correspondence between an HGV configuration and its HCP translation. Now, translating in the other direction from HCP into HGV is trickier since we only use hyperenvironments in typing processes and not terms. So we don't split fork into spawn and knee, for example, since this ends up being more trouble than it's worth. We can't get a direct translation, but what we can do is translate HCP to HGV if we go via CP. So we use Cocker et al's disentanglement translation to translate HCP into CP. Then we use a small tweak on Lindley and Morris's translation to translate CP to GV. And then we've already shown that all, uh, all processes typable in GV are typable in HGV. Um, so we've now got a, the full translation. Okay, so to sum up. This paper is about the correspondence between session typed functional programming and linear logic. Hyperenvironments have been really useful in the setting of CP in order to pull CP terms apart and therefore support a behavioural theory. So we've used hyperenvironments to fix GV's typing under structural congruence, and we've used HCP's LTS semantics to support a much stronger logical correspondence without needing to resort to explicit substitutions. In the paper, we also show how HGV can be easily extended to support flexible channel forwarding and exceptions. Now, our ultimate aim is to get a logically grounded foundation for functional programming with multi-party session types, and we think that HGV is an important step in that direction. Okay, that's everything I've got. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I'd be very happy to take any questions.